Hey guys, uh, welcome back to our beginner lectures for this semester. Um, this week we're going to be talking about dynamic programming, um, which we did have a beginner lecture on last semester. Um, this lecture is kind of intended both to, um, like, it'll serve as an introduction for DP if you haven't seen it before, if you didn't see our lecture last semester. Um, but if you did, uh, we got a lot of new problems, and this is kind of going to build on that a little bit. So yeah. Uh, first, we're going to do um, just a quick introduction to DP, um, or a refresher for those of you who've seen it before. Um, basically, uh, the simplest example we can do here is Fibonacci numbers, right? We want to compute the nth Fibonacci number. Um, so Fibonacci numbers defined by, or we're letting the zeroth one be zero, the first one be one, um, and then for everything bigger than that, each number is the sum of the previous two. And basically, we want to be able to compute these quickly. Um, so one uh, solution we could do is basically just do it recursively, right? So um, we have this function Fibonacci i, which will take in a number and give you the nth Fibonacci number, right? Because we have our two base cases here, right? Because if i is less than 2, then we can just return i. Otherwise, we return Fibonacci i minus 1. Uh, plus Fibonacci i minus 2. Um, now, does anyone know the problem with this solution? Uh, it's exp um, But it will be exponential in complexity, right? So this, yeah, so the, the video that we used to use to show this is gone. But you can see the tree here, right? Basically, the idea is we're splitting Fibonacci 6 into Fibonacci 5 and Fibonacci 4. And then we're splitting 5 into 4 and 3, and 4 into 3 and 2. And we're just sort of branching this whole tree all the way down. Um, and so we're going to have like about 2 to the n function calls. Um, it's not exactly that, but it's exponential, which is definitely a problem. Um, so the way we're going to get around this is. Um, notice that there's a lot of redundancy here, right? So like when we're computing this whole tree, we don't really have to, right? Because we're computing Fibonacci 4 here and we're computing Fibonacci 4 here, right? So there's like a lot of duplicate work there. And there's, you can look at like all the other numbers. We have a lot of threes, we have a lot of twos. So we're doing a lot of duplicate work here. Um, so basically the idea with dynamic programming is um, you want to basically eliminate all the duplicate work. And the way we're going to do that is the first time we compute each Fibonacci number, just store the value in an array. And then every time after that, we just need to access that value in constant time. Right? So we'll initially fill our array with some default value, like negative 1 is what we usually use. Um, and then, so the first time we compute the number, we replace that negative one with whatever the actual answer is. And then every time after that, instead of having to, say, recompute DP4 or Fibonacci 4 and do this whole tree, we just do an O of 1 array lookup. OK. Um, so here's one way that we can write this. Uh, it's known as top-down DP. Um, this is basically the recursive solution we had before, except you're going to add in a check at the beginning. Um, and basically all this is doing is when you're doing your recursion, you just check um, if the current value has been calculated already, right? So if we've already calculated dp of i, which is going to represent Fibonacci number of i um, in this example, if we've already computed this, we can just return it, right? So if it's not negative one, we can just return it. Otherwise, we do the usual recursion. Um, so this, um, there's been some debate like among RECPE board about what the easiest way to learn DP is. Um, personally, I think this is probably a harder way to learn it, um, but this makes it much easier for complicated problems. Um, I know Akif would argue that this is the easier way to learn it. Um, so we'll get to the other way in a second. My advice would be just look at both and see which one works for you. All right. It also depends very much on the problem. Like b Joe and I will both yeah. use different either one of the strategies depending on the problem that we're doing. So yeah. 
Okay. Um, and one thing is, if you want to compute the runtime for top-down DP, um, the way you do it is you take the number of states, which is basically like the number of elements in your array, um, and you multiply it by the runtime for one iteration of the recursion. And basically, the way we compute that is just assume that these are uh, function calls are constant time. And then what's the runtime of this function? So in this case, um, if these are both constant time function calls, the runtime of this function is O of 1. So we have O of n states here times O of 1 per state. So the total runtime is O of n. Um, and then uh, the other way you can do dp is bottom-up dp. And this is basically just doing it with a for loop. Um, so this is probably, like specifically for Fibonacci numbers, this is probably the way that most people would code it. Um, you basically just do your base cases at the beginning, and then you go through your array in whatever the proper order is. In this case, you have to go ascending order, right? And then you just compute it like this. Um, the, the one thing that does make this method harder when you get to more complicated problems is the fact that you do have to compute the values in order, right? Because here, with the top down, you can you don't really have to know what order you're computing the values in, if that makes any sense, right? Like all you need to know, all you need to code is what do you have to do for i? Um, and then, you know, that depends on i minus one, i minus two, but you don't have to compute i minus one and i minus two before you compute i. You can sort of do it while you're computing i. Um, and when you get into more complicated problems, it can be harder to figure out what order to do all of your DP states in. Um, but yeah. Any questions on uh, DP or either of these two methods? OK, cool. So now we can get into the bulk of this lecture, which is going to be basically just trying a bunch of problems. Uh, because really, the only way to get good at DP is to do a lot of problems. So that's what we're going to do here. All right, so for the first problem, um, you have an array, and you want to pick some subsequence of elements such that the alternating sum is maximized. Right, uh, and so by alternating sum, basically what we mean is um, you're going to add every other element and then subtract every other element. Right, so plus two minus one plus five minus three plus seven. Um, you you want to basically pick some subsequence here, so you have to maintain the order, but you're allowed to skip elements, um, and you want to maximize the alternating sum. So in this case, the best you can do is two. 1, 5, 3, 7, which gives you an alternating sum of 10. And we're looking for an O of n dp solution here. So I'll give you guys a minute to think about that. Oh, one thing I didn't mention in the introduction that's a very helpful thing, these DP problems, is the way you kind of want to think about it is you're breaking up the problem into smaller instances of the problem, right? Because with Fibonacci numbers, you're breaking up computing the i Fibonacci number into like the i minus 1 Fibonacci number and the i minus 2 Fibonacci number, right? Um, you're, you're sort of breaking up your problem into smaller instances of it, and you keep breaking those up until eventually you get to your base cases. Um, so when you're thinking about this problem, think about how you can sort of break this up into smaller instances of this problem, and then eventually get down to a base case of some kind. The other thing sort of goes along with that. You'll see this in textbooks a lot that they do it like this. But is like once you break it, once you have this idea of oh, I'm going to break it down to a bunch of smaller problems, you also want there to be a lot of overlap between those subproblems. 
you know, just like we had for the Fibonacci, the tree had a whole bunch of overlap that we could then memorize, uh, if you could pre compute like, remember the answers to those sub subproblems and then lose the overlap, you need the same thing over here to actually be able to use DP nicely, is that yeah. you want there to be a lot of overlap. So think about that. Yeah, so if you guys have any ideas, like even um, just like, yes, exactly. Um, and specifically, this is something that's going to come up a lot. Um, you want to think about like prefixes of the array, right? So like in some sense, this isn't exactly what the DP state would be, but in some sense, you want the answer to be DP of I is the answer for the prefix of size I. Right. And so then you sort of want to think about how you can compute the answer for some prefix of the array, given the answers for all the other prefixes. And this is basically going to come up in every DP problem involving an array. Um, so it's a very useful thing to um, keep in mind. Another trick that's going to come up here is um, just because you have to be O of N here, uh, you can have like a 2D DP, right? If you have like N by a constant, right? It doesn't have to just be one long array of size N. Um, you're allowed to have like a constant number of arrays of length N for your DP. Or you can think about it as even like multiple different DP arrays. Sort of going off of that, um, Joe mentioned you want to break your original problem into like subproblems, right, of the same problem, right? But sometimes that mm -hmm. isn't possible. So then you want to take your original problem yeah. and make a bigger, more general version of that problem, and then that can be broken up into subproblems of itself. And that's a very useful technique too. Yeah. So kind of putting all this together, um, kind of the goal is you're looking at some prefix of size i. Right, and you want to compute what's the answer on this prefix, given, say, the answer on the previous prefix. And so how can you, like, manipulate the DP state or set up a DP arrays such that you can do that? Yeah, there is like a trick in the state here. Okay. Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. Like to get the max, you're kind of subtracting off the min or something like that. Um, I, I guess the hint here is that you're kind of being too smart. Um, being smart is like good for greedy approach to problems or stuff or like just like add, like just trying to be smart with the problem but dp is more about like being stupid and just letting the code do the work i think and yeah that is like that might work right? if you do it correctly but I, i'm not sure how you would make it work um Let's see one what do you mean by current sum? So 
Um, the Max Min thing is definitely like on the right track because like you kind of have to have some way of treating the pluses and minuses differently, right? Um, so think about how you could like put that in your DP state. Wait, Arvin, what happened? Your thing looked like it might be close to somewhere, but what do you mean by like the word in your thing? Uh, I'm not really sure on second thought. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think this one would be okay bottom up. Um, thinking about it bottom up is probably going to be hard for some of the next couple problems, but this one bottom up, yeah. I'll give you guys a hint. You want like an n by 2 dp table. And so the n is going to be like the size of your prefix. Um, not quite. There are some problems where uh, you do include that in the DP state, but you don't have to for this one. Because here, when you take or don't take, you can just literally do the action of taking or not taking. You don't need to remember that. You can just either take it and add this the element or not take it and then don't. So you don't actually need that for you. Yeah, because you don't have a constraint of like you can only take like elements that are not next to each other or something. That's usually when that will show up. Um, um, oh, yeah, I think you might have it in your bin. What do you mean by positive sum? Uh, like sum up all the positive elements. In for one of them, one of the two for each size of n, and then and then the negative for the other. That's close. Um, I mean, you can't really separate those out, right? Like you can't do the negative elements independently of the positive because they have to sort of like interleave together like that, but that's close. Like it, it is, you do want to sort of treat the positives and the negatives differently using this extra dimension of size two you have. I think I'll show you guys this one because you've gotten very close. Um, okay. So we want our DP state to be uh, n by 2, right? And so the difference between DPI 0 and DPI 1 is uh, this is the answer on the prefix up to i, assuming that the last element you added is negative. And here it's the last element you added is positive. All right, so let's say this is your array. DP30 um, would be here, right? So you're at, you're at the three. And you want, what's the uh, maximum answer on this segment such that the last one you added is negative? And the answer is going to be four there because you take positive five and negative one. Um, notice that we're not taking three. 
right? We're just saying on this segment, what's the best answer such that you end on a negative? And here, DP51 is going to be here. Um, so now we want the best answer on the whole array such that you end on a positive, which would be 10, because you take 5, 1, 6. Does this make sense? Uh, so what's like the, like the base base case for this? Yeah. So, um, you could think about the base case as like the empty array, right? So DP of the empty array zero and empty array one are both going to be zero, because you can think about, um, like if if your array is empty, you can consider your last element to be negative or positive. It doesn't matter really. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The states are last operation plus or last operation minus. Exactly. And then the lookup is going to kind of swap between the rows. Um, so the way that would work is, yeah, here's the code. Um, so we have top-down code for this. I think all of our code for these is going to be top-down, but the bottom-up would be similar. Um, yeah, so like I said, the, the base case is going to be the empty array. Right, so i less than zero kind of represents the empty array. Um, this is another nice feature of doing top down, is you can have uh, negative indices here, right? Because we're not accessing the array using our negative indices. We just kind of have a base case at the top here. Um, so that's a nice thing that you can't do as well bottom up. But anyway, um, the base case is the empty array, where the answer is zero for either j. Right. Um, so then we do our check to see if we've already computed it. Um, then we have a couple options. So if we don't take the current element, then the answer will be r i minus one j, right? Because we're just we're ignoring the current element. We're just going to the one before, and we're looking at that with the same state. Um, otherwise, if j equals zero, which is representing um, the next one we have, we take is going to be negative then um, we max dpij with um, dpi minus 1, 1 minus ai, right? So we're taking everything before it that ends on a positive and then negative ai. And we do the opposite thing if we have to take a positive. We take everything before it ending on a negative plus ai. And then in the end, we can just return dpij. Um, any questions on this? OK, cool. All right, so the next problem is plates. Um, you're given n stacks of k plates each, where every plate has a beauty value, which is just some integer. Um, we want to take exactly p plates with the maximal sum of beauty. And if you take a plate, you have to take all the plates on top of it, right? So we have n stacks. If you want to take a plate, you got to take everything on top. And we're looking for an O of n times p times k dp solution. Oh, uh, we could take a look at the take logic one more time, just quickly. Basically, like if you take, um, so j equals zero represents the last element you take has to be negative. So if we're going to take it, that means it has to be negative. And then when you move on to the prefix before that, the next one we take has to be positive. Whereas it's kind of the opposite if we have to take a positive, right? Because if we take a positive, if we want to take the current element, it has to be positive. Yeah, yeah, j equals zero is negative, right? OK. Probably should have put a picture for this one just to make it clear. Um, but the statement makes sense to everyone. You have n independent stacks here.
And so, yeah, like with um, all the problems we're going to do, the first thing to think about is what is the DP state going to be? Uh, I don't have a picture, but I, ha I got the sample cases from code from Kickstart where it's from, I think, right? Oh, nice. I can yeah. post those in the thing. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so here you want to pick five plates. Okay, yeah. And in the first case, you want to pick five plates. Um, and you have to sort of pick from the top of the stacks. So the best you can do is you take the 100, the 10, the 80, the 30, the 50. And that is going to add up to 250, I think. Wait, that's... More than 250? Oh, I'm misunderstanding the stacks. The stacks are the rows. Oh, yeah, that's weird. It just makes it easier for input reading, but it's not intuitive for looking at a problem. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, so you want to take, you can only take from the right, I guess, in this case. In the so, left? The left? Am I wrong? Yes, left. the left. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you can only take from the left. <laughs> Um, so you want to take 10, 10, 100 from the first stack and 80, 50 from the second stack. Um, yeah. 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 yeah in, in this it, case, it just made it easier to read input and then even code the solution. This makes a lot more sense, but for right, visualizing yeah. it makes no sense. Yeah, th those are the five plates you would take. Um, yeah, in, in terms of visualizing, it's probably... I, I guess you could think about it either way. Uh, and so for the next one, you just take the 80 and the 80 from that one, the whole, whole first stack, and then you take the 20 from the last stack. And that's your three plates. Yes. Yeah, so what kind of information would you want in your DP state? So hint number one is um, you have this array of stacks. Um, your index in that array is going to be an important part of your DP state. Because it's kind of like with any DP problem, you, you want to do DP on the prefixes of your array. But then in addition to that, what else do you want? Exactly. Um, yeah, there's, there's a couple things that I guess you could mean by that. Um, yeah, I, I think you have it. Um, basically, what you want for your DP state here is DPIJ. Um, is, oh, so in this one, we're looking at suffixes of the array instead of prefixes. It, for the most part, you can do DP problems either way. Um, so here we're looking at some suffix of the array starting at position i. And we've already chosen j plates. And we want to know what's the maximum beauty you can obtain on this suffix. Um, and so the way you do this is you iterate over how many plates you want to take off of the current stack. Right. Um, so if you take L plates on the current stack, then your answer is going to be the sum of the first L plates on the current stack, right? Plus DP of the next stack. So if you now move one stack over and you look at the suffix starting there, and now you have, oh, this should be J plus L, sorry. Um, and now you've taken J plus L plates already. And then you go from there.
right? Does this state make sense? So your DP table is going to be, so your position goes up to N, right? Because you have N stacks. Um, J is going to go up to P, right? Because you can pick up to P plates. Um, so this is an N by P table. So you have NP DP states. And you're doing this for loop here, um, which goes up to K, right? Because you have K plates per stack. Um, so your runtime is going to be O of NPK. I mean, so as it's written, it looks like it'll be K squared here, but it's not. See, if I can... Right. Because well, when you keep it... Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, so you have to kind of um, maintain this sum as you're going. You can't actually do this whole addition um, like in the for loop. Um, but as long as you have these prefix sums pre-computed, that's fine. You don't even need to. You can just do the running sum. It's, it's... Yeah, you can just do the running sum. That works too. Does this state make sense? Okay, cool. So uh, code for this, it's going to look like this. Um, so if i equals n, this is our base case. This is when we're past the end of the array. Once again, our base case is like the empty array. So here it's the empty suffix. Um, so uh, if this is another trick we do a lot. Uh, so if you want to make sure that you've taken exactly J things, or P things in this case, um, at the end of your array, you can check if J equals P. So if we've taken P things and we're at the end of the array, then you return 0. Otherwise, you return minus infinity. And this way, if you take like more than p things or less than p things, um, this minus infinity will balance out whatever sums you had before. So the only ones that will count in this max are the ones where you had 0. Um, the idea is to kind of give yourself an infinite penalty for taking the wrong number of plates at the end. And that forces you to have taken the right number. Wait, Joe, does this work? Don't you need to Doesn't. also have a, a allow for DP to update once you've summed up everything potentially? Or am I... Like all K um, of them? Oh. Yeah. The way I have it is like different. That's why I was... Just slightly, but like just because of that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Or I guess we should fix this code afterwards then. I, yeah. Anyway. The only um, reason I noticed is because I had my Kickstarter code open on the side. Oh, nice. Because <laughs> I was looking up the test cases. Uh, here, here's the relevant part. It's 90% the same thing. It's just you. Yeah. yeah. Make sure you turn. Okay. Yeah. And so basically all this for loop is doing is iterate over how many you take off the current stack. Um, and then you're maintaining a sum of like what the sum of the first L plates is on that stack. And then you're looking at uh, DP of I plus one, J plus L from there. So this is just computing the state we had on the previous slide. All right, um, any more questions on this? Yeah, this is a bit harder to visualize than the last one. Um, but yeah, as long as the DP state itself makes sense, that's good. OK. Longest common subsequence. Um, so here you have strings of length. You have a string S of length n and T of length m. And you want to print the length of their longest common subsequence. Um, so basically, again, a subsequence is you're picking out some elements of the string, and you have to maintain order, but you're allowed to skip some. And you want the longest subsequence that appears in both strings. So here, it would be A, A, D, A, um, and A, A, D, A, and T. And you have a few options of how to pick your A, A, D, A, but that doesn't matter. 
because all we're looking for is the length, really. And we want an O of n times m dp solution, where those are the lengths of the two strings. So again, this, this step one would be to think about um, what do you want to have in your dp state? Yes, exactly. And um, what uh, do you represent with that? You probably have it. But... Exactly. It's like, how far are you going in each dimension? Right? And so, yes, yeah, so you have like some prefix of S and some prefix of T, and you want the longest common subsequence. So how can you compute that then. Let's say you want dp ij. Um. Yeah. What do you? Uh, his I understood his last yeah. message. Um. The second to last yeah. one. So if, if if it matches, then you move both the pointers, right? But both the indices. Uh, okay. Yeah. If it doesn't, then yeah, max of. You have a couple different, like I think that's right though. It's hard to understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 that's it. Uh, you're missing like couple details, but that's pretty much it, I think. He's saying if it doesn't match, then you move either this one or this oh, one, right? Oh, okay, wait, I, I, yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that that is um, the solution for this. Basically, what you want is, so again, dpij is the length of the longest common subsequence of the first i characters of s and the first j characters of t. Right, so if, um, if SI and TJ match, um, then we always want to take them in the LCS. So if the last characters match, we can always include them in the LCS, like for free, and that's never going to hurt us. So in that case, dpij is dpi minus 1, j minus 1, plus 1. Otherwise, um, we can't take both of them, right? Because we can't take both of the last characters if they don't match, right? Because then um, the two the subsequences wouldn't end on the same character. Um, so we look at what happens if we exclude one of the characters and what happens if we exclude the other one. And notice that these are both kind of narrowing down your search space because in one, you're eliminating one character and the other, you're also eliminating a character. So your prefixes keep getting shorter um, and you keep recursing down to your base case. All right, um, so the code for this one is very nice. Um, you basically just do this. So um, again, we have a base case. If one of our prefixes is empty, then we return zero because the LCS of anything with empty string is just zero. Um, if we check if we've already computed it, then um, if the characters match, then we go look at i minus one, j minus one, and we add one. Right, because we have the plus one because we're matching these two characters and adding that onto the end of the subsequence here. And if we can't match them, then we're going to uh, eliminate character i of s and see what we get there, or eliminate character j of t and see what we get there and take the max. All right. Um, any questions on this problem or the code or anything? OK, cool. So the next problem uh, is actually pretty similar to the last one. Um, we're going to do the minimum edit distance between two strings. So again, we have two strings, s and t. 
and we want the minimum edit distance between them, um, which is the number of operations you need to turn S into T. Um, so an operation here is you can either remove any character from S, add any character to S. These two can happen at any position in the string um, or replace any character in S. Um, so like in the example here, if we want to turn Sunday into Saturday, um, we can start by turning the N into an R in one operation, then adding an A in one operation, then adding a T in one operation. So here the minimum edit distance is three. And once again, we want a O of length of S times length of T solution. So the hint is you're going to kind of have the same DP state as the last problem, where it's the first I characters of S and the first J characters of T. The difference here is that you have sort of like many more moves and the moves are slightly more complicated than right. the very simple moves in the last problem, which is cut one off I, cut one off J, or take both of them because they match. Yeah. But it's definitely useful to think about, like, think about this kind of in the same way as the last problem, right? Because, like, in the last problem, it's either you cut them both off or you cut one off or you cut the other off. Um, and it's going to be kind of similar here, but you have to keep track of operations as you go. Um, so, so think about like how you can kind of adapt the solution for the last one, sort of, um, to solve this problem. Yeah. Okay, so we've already talked about here. Here's a hint that we've already given you. Uh, so dpij, we want the minimum edit distance of the first i characters of s and the first j characters of t. And so then how do you compute this given other dp values? Yeah, so the, the operations are you can insert a character anywhere in the string S. No, 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 you have, you no, have no, the no. option of uh, doing all You have the, options. Yeah. Yeah. You can do any of these options. Right, yeah. Yes, exactly. You want to find distance between different prefixes. And it's going to look a lot like the previous problem. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And so what's remove? I think that's probably one of the easiest ones. What's remove? Uh, like what would happen to I and J, right, for remove? Uh, another thing is you do have a fourth option, which is to do nothing. Um, or I guess by do nothing, I mean like not operate on some characters, right? Because you don't have to change all the characters. Um, so that's that's kind of a fourth case to think about. And again, it's gonna be helpful if you think about like, um, yes, exactly. So if you're uh, removing a character from S, um, then you want to look at dp i minus 1 j plus 1, right? Because if you're removing the ith character of s, um, 
now you're doing one operation, so that's where the plus one comes from. And now you're looking at the i minus one prefix of s and the j prefix of t. So you do dp i minus one j plus one. Um, and if you're removing from t, which is the same as adding to s if you think about it, then you do the same thing um, but swapped, which is what I think you were saying with the j minus one. Right? So if you're removing from t, um, then you want to look at dp i j minus one plus one. Yeah. So that covers remove and add. Um, yeah, because um, they're kind of the same operation, sort of. You can think about removing from S as adding to T and vice versa. Um, so, I mean, in the problem, you're only allowed to operate on S, but like it works the same way if you're allowed to operate on T because um, it's symmetric basically right because like replacing is definitely symmetric um and then add and remove kind of work symmetrically with each other i mean just um, looking at the example you can like remove the t from saturday right instead right, of adding yeah. the t and then remove yeah. the a and then replacing which is just still just replacement and you get yeah that. so uh how would replacing work then That is pretty much right. Um, so the idea is like if you replace the character in S, right? You can so you're looking at the last character of S and the last character of T. You can replace the last character of S with the last character of T, and then they'll match. And then you can just go to the previous two characters and fix that. So it will be dp i minus one j minus one um, plus one, right? You have the plus one for the one replace operation. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the solution. Um, the do nothing is still like, what's up with that, right? Yeah. I think I kind of mentioned that when I was talking about the replace. OK. Um, but yeah, how, how do you handle the do nothing case? Or when are you allowed to do nothing, I guess? And by do nothing, I mean do nothing on the last character of S and the last character of T. You might have to do stuff before that. And the, the hint is it's very similar to replacement. Right. It's I minus one, J minus one but without the plus one, because you don't need the operation beforehand to do the replace. So, okay, uh, just we have all this written out here. Yeah, so here is what your DP state is going to be. Um, so for DP IJ, if S I minus one equals T I minus one, um, then it's gonna be optimal not to change either of those characters, right? Um, you just wanna leave them both the way they are because they already match and that's good. So we just do dpij equals dpi minus 1j minus 1. Otherwise, we have to do some kind of operation to fix them. So dpi minus 1j plus 1 represents removing the character in s at the ith position, right? Because now we're looking at i minus 1 instead of i. Um, i j minus 1 plus 1 represents adding the character tj minus 1 to s in the ith position. Um, so by adding that character, we can kind of decrement our index in t by 1, because we've now matched that character. And then, um, like we were talking about, i minus 1, j minus 1 plus 1 represents editing the character in s at the ith position to the character in the jth position of t. Um, so what we can do is take the min of all three of these operations and let dpij be the min of these things plus 1. All right, so code for this is again pretty nice. 
um, you can basically do this. Um, so here, our base cases are going to be, again, the empty string, which we represent by i equals 0 or j equals 0 here. And um, notice that the answer for our base case isn't 0 here, right? Because the edit distance between an empty string and some other string is the number of characters in that other string, right? Because you have to either add or remove each of those characters. Um, so dp0 j equals j, dp i0 equals i, basically. Um, and then if they match, we can again just move them both back because they already match. Otherwise, we have the choice of these three operations. Um, so we take the min of all those and we add one. All right, um, any questions on this? OK. So we have one more problem. Um, this is actually a pretty recent one from a Code Forces round. Um, so some of you guys might remember this if you did this round. Um, so there's a road of length L kilometers. Um, on this road, you have n speed limit signs, um, which aren't really speed limit signs. Um, they're kind of, I don't know, I guess you could call them like time limit signs, um, where you must take ti minutes to drive each kilometer until you see the next sign. Um, so they basically just did this to make it easier to work with, right? So if you have to get between, say, the 4 and the 8 with a limit of 3, you can do that in... This is four kilometers. Each one takes three minutes. You can do it in 12 minutes. All right. Um, also, you're guaranteed that there's one sign at the start of the road. So your speed limit is always defined. It's always the most recent sign you've seen. Um, so you can remove up to k of the signs, um, excluding the first one, because again, it always has to be defined. And you want to minimize the time you need to travel the whole road. And so uh, what is the minimal travel time? And we're looking for an n cubed solution here. Because with n equals 500, you can usually get away with n cubed. And this is one where coming up with the DP state is probably most of the work. Think of like the plates one. This is reminiscent of that one, I think. Yes, yeah. yeah think about what information you kind of have to store to figure out how to like get from some point to the end or something. Yeah, so one one part of your state is going to be which sign are you at, right? So you're at some sign, you're trying to go to the end. Um, what other information do you need to keep track of? And by you're at some sign, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that sign still exists, right? You might have removed that sign, but you're at the position of some sign or where some sign used to be the beginning of the problem. Um, so the total time is going to be what you're like storing in the DP. It's not really going to be like a parameter to help you compute it. 
right? Because the time is like your answer that you're storing in the DP. But there is other information that you need. Yeah, it's it's basically the speed. It's like one over the speed, so you don't have to deal yeah, with one over. Yeah, pretty much. Basically. Yeah, I mean that doesn't matter too much for doing the problem. Just imagine, like, given the sign and the distance, you can compute the time. That's all that really matters. And you basically just multiply them. So this up to k of the signs is a very important part of the problem. Like Akif said, it's similar to the plates problem. Because you can't remove all the signs. No, so distance we don't really need to worry about too much. Um, so this L less than 10 to the 5th, this could be like 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 18th, and it wouldn't really affect the solution much. Because you have, a kind of the way you want to think about it is, um, you have like an array of signs, and you're looking at some suffix of the signs, and you want to know what's minimum time to traverse that suffix, basically, with some additional information. Here, oh. Uh, Give you guys the DP state. Because um, this is a tricky one to figure out. And then see if you can um, figure out how to compute it using the other ones. So let's say we want to compute DP IJK, which is the minimum time to reach the end starting from sign at position I, such that we can remove K signs, like on that suffix, and the current speed limit is given by sine j. So by current speed limit, I mean speed limit at sine i. So like as you drive up to sine i, your speed limit is given by sine j. So how can we compute this in terms of other dp values? What are like the moves you can make? Think, think about yeah, what are your options when you reach sine i for the first time? As a hint, you have like two options, really. Exactly. Either you remove the sign or you don't. Um, and based on that, we can compute which state you end up in. All right. So there's a lot of indices here. So I'm not going to make you guys like go through that and figure out exactly where the plus one, minus ones are, or whatever. But basically, the idea, I'll just give it to you guys. So let's let di be the distance between sine i and sine i plus 1, um, and ti be the time limit on sine i. So then uh, dpijk, we want to take the answer if we remove sine i and the answer if we keep sine i. So if we remove sine i, then the speed limit will still be tj. Right. So it will take us tj times di to reach sine i plus 1. Um, and then once we get there, the answer will be dp of i plus 1, because we're at position i plus 1, j, because the current speed limit is given by sine j, k minus 1, because we have we can remove up to k minus 1 signs. Um, notice that you can only do this option if k is greater than 0, right? Because you can't do this if you can't remove a sign. Um, if we keep sine i, then... Um, 
to get to sine i plus one, the speed limit is given by sine i. So we do ti times di plus um, dp i plus one i k. Because we're at sine i plus one, speed limit is given by sine i because we didn't remove it. And we can remove up to k signs still because we haven't removed any at step i. Um, and we can compute this in O of 1. Um, so this was my first approach when I saw the problem. Um, and time complexity wise, it's fine. Um, but one problem that came up is the memory, which can sometimes be an issue when you're trying to do big DPs. Um, so it's O of n cubed time, but it's also O of n cubed memory, which will exceed the memory limit. So um, the sort of trick we want to do is we want to reduce the memory to n squared, um, even though time will still be n cubed. Um, and we kind of want to remove one part of our dp state and replace it with a for loop um, sort of inside the dp calculations. Um, This is kind of a tricky thing to figure out. Um, and we are over a bit. So I think I might just show you guys the second solution. Because um, it's hard to kind of see how to modify a DP solution sometimes if it's not working. Um, so what we want to do here is we're going to make a new DP state without J. right? So we kind of want to encode the same stuff without using J, which is giving us the current speed limit. And the way we can do this is have dpik be the minimum time to get from sine i to the end. If you can remove up to k signs on the way, given that you have to keep sine i. So you're not allowed to remove sine i. Um, and this idea shows up in a lot of dp problems. Um, I know someone was talking about like dp of whether you keep it, whether you don't keep it. So this is one of those problems. Um, so how can we compute this dp state now? Um, so if we let pi be the position of sine i and ti be the time limit on sine i, you basically want to, so we're at position i, we're at sine number i, and we have k removes left. Um, we want to iterate over what's the next sign that we don't remove, right? Because we're going to drive from sine i up to the next sign we don't remove. And we're not going to take any signs on the way, right? So the speed limit is going to be given by sine i that whole time. So we want to iterate over which sign is the next one we're going to keep, right? So let's say sine j is the next one we keep after sine i. Um, oh, that should not be k minus 1. That is my bad. That is... k minus j minus i? j minus i minus 1. Um, so if we're, yeah, so if we're at position I and J is the next one we don't remove, we're going to travel from PI to PJ with the speed limit of I, and then we'll be at position J, and we know we have to keep the sign at position J because we said we would, um, and we have K minus the amount of things we removed in the middle removes left. All right, does this make any sense? Okay, cool. So now um, you, you can see that we only hear depend... that uh, you can't take more than k away. That you can't make that third dimension be negative. Exactly. So you limit there. Uh, yeah, you, you limit your for loop on j here. Um, so notice here that we have n squared dp states, and each one takes o of n to calculate, as opposed to constant time for the previous one. Um, so this is still n cubed, but we now only have n squared memory, and this solution will pass. And code for this is going to look like this. Um, so here, pause is the position of the sign, and this is the speed limit of the sign, or the time limit, or whatever. Um, and so yeah, basically, you're just going to iterate over which j 
this is just a terrible for loop macro. Um, you're going to iterate over which j is the next one you keep. Um, if this number is less than k, this is the number of removals you have in between. If this is less than k, then um, you do dpik as the min of this, and the distance times the speed of i plus the answer going forward from there. All right. Any last questions? OK, cool. So yeah, uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, as always, these slides are in our uh, info channel on Discord. And recording should be up soon. Um, so next Thursday is going to be our ICPC tryouts. Um, in-person Hill Center uh, or virtual. Um, and same thing on Saturday for anyone who can't make it then. So yeah, thank you guys. <laughs>